I'm here today with David Sobel, a, an author for EarthEd, Rethinking Education on a Changing Planet, one of the um, most striking chapters for me, being a uh, father of a young child who I really want to get out into nature all the time. He wrote uh, chapter two, Outdoor School for All, Reconnecting Children to Nature. And uh, David is an author of eight books on childhood and nature and is senior faculty in the education department at Antioch University, New England. And I invited him here today to have a little conversation. I, I wanted to pick his brain and ask some questions about nature preschools and forest kindergartens. Thank you so much, David, for joining today. It's great to be here, Eric, and I think that that was a great introduction. I've been an Antioch University New England faculty member for many decades, and this whole field of children and nature has been my passion, so I'm thrilled to talk about it. Great, and I'm, I'm really thankful you can be here. I want to dive right in. Uh, first of all, the obvious question for those who might not um, be following this discussion, but why is getting children into nature and building their relationship with nature so important? There are lots of reasons. Uh, I think the children and health uh, issue is one of the great reasons. So children in the past uh, decade have become more digitalized and more endorified um, and um, more academified in, in terms of schools. So, but the endorification and the digitalization means that kids don't move and don't develop and they become couch potatoes. And uh, so one reason for having kids in nature, either uh, recreationally or in school, is so that the physical development that's supposed to happen in early and middle childhood is actually happening. Uh, above and beyond that, there's the whole uh, benefits of children bonding with nature so that they become, uh, uh, so that they develop environmental affinities and, and uh, will behave in environmentally sensitive ways when they become adults. There's really good research that shows without the kind of bonding experience in nature in childhood, it's less likely that adults are going to be environmentally conscious and conscientious. Um, and from an academic perspective, there's lots of good research that suggests that uh, uh, school programs that uh, use the natural environment or use the nearby community environment uh, as the ground for learning are effective at engaging kids in curriculum and therefore when kids are engaged they're more likely to be academically successful great so that answers a little bit of the next question but but what is the value of, of nature preschools and forest kindergartens why Kind of really focus in on nature for those first few years? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm essentially a biological determinist in my thinking about kids in nature. And essentially that means that I think we're, uh, we're driven by our biology and our genetic inheritance. And I think that we are essentially genetically hunters and gatherers. Uh, you know, we evolved 95% of our time as hunters and gatherers. So there's hunting and gathering uh, cultural traditions that are part of our, our genotype. So what we need to do is look at what happens to kids in hunting and gathering cultures as the natural frame, as the prototype for what kids should be doing. Um, and kids are closely bound to the family up until around three or four years old, and then starting around four, they start to move out into the environment and learn the plants and animals uh, of the nearby environment. And I think it's the learning, and that learning of plants and animals uh, and, and how to survive and how to develop resilience, all those things are what children in the four, five, six-year-old age range ought to be doing. Um, and so uh, my sense is that Nature preschools, forest kindergartens, forest schools are uh, bringing, are drawing on kids' natural inclinations to want to understand and learn about the natural world. And those things can become the foundation for language development and math development and science concepts uh, in a kind of seamless way. Uh, and it's much easier in those contexts than it is in an indoors environment. 
that makes sense. But but then that begs the question of of why stop with only nature preschools rather than nature kindergarten uh, elementary schools, nature middle schools, nature high schools, and nature colleges. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So the great the great story you know, is this uh, school district in Michigan where the nature preschool, a very successful nature preschool called the Chippewa Nature Preschool, um, developed a parent body that was really enthusiastic about um, uh, nature preschool. And then they said, well, we don't want our kids to go to public school kindergarten and lose this. So the parents and the director of the nature center advocated with the local public school district. And the local public school district opened up um, one nature kindergarten, but there was so much parental interest that they needed to do three nature kindergartens. And then the nature kindergarten families said, well, um, we don't want the kids to be going into first grade and not having this opportunity. So the school district implemented nature first grade. Um, and now they're talking about nature second grade. So, and then there's other examples of little pieces happening in other upper grades in that school district. So, yes, um, you, you move with preschools and forest kindergartens. It's more appropriate for the natural world to be the primary experience. And then as kids move up through the grades, the place should become the primary experience. So it becomes the natural world and the cultural uh, community world as well. Um, uh, but there should always be some component of nature engagement, you know, throughout the age spans. That makes sense. I'm wondering, I mean, with such extensive study of nature preschools and forest kindergartens, what are the best practices? What are they doing right? What, what could be improved on? Uh, so both best practices and, and kind of where the room for improvement. Yeah, best practices are, um, there's a great study that we just kind of completed of Vermont and New Hampshire uh, public schools that are doing forest days. Um, and forest days are one day a week in the woods or most of one day a week in the woods. Um, and it's a really good dip your toe in the water, take a first step for a lot of public school teachers who have all those academic claims made on them. And the, the really good things that they're doing are, uh, they understand that being outdoors is different than being indoors, and so you have to acclimate kids to the outdoor environment as a learning environment. So it's not recess when kids are out in the outdoor classroom, it's still school. Um, so they have, uh, they have very structured uh, uh, trajectories of their day that include teacher-directed activities and more uh, between the stuff that's academically driven and the stuff that's more kid-centric. Um, and um, there's a thorough engagement of uh, administration and partners. So in one of these programs in Heartland, Vermont, you know, they've got uh, parents coming in and helping them build the outdoor shelters that they need for the kids. Because in Vermont, when they're, outdoor, when they're outdoors all year long, they're out in the winter, so they Hello, Vermont, they have the fire department instruct the kids on fire safety because an outdoor fire is also an integral part of the program in the winter. So this balance between academic, the academics that uh, public school teachers need to address and the, the more child-directed uh, nature exploration is one of the good practices. Great, and, and, and room to improve. What, what, what is the next kind of horizon that nature preschools need to grapple with? Well, both the uh, room to improve is that, yes, this practice needs to move up through the grades. So that over the last five years on best practices in nature-based early childhood. This year at Antioch University, New England, we're doing a conference on um, 
nature-based practices in the K through six grades. So one thing we need to be doing is saying, okay, this is successful in early childhood. How do we help elementary school teachers do the same thing? My wife is doing this as a sixth grade teacher and the, the richness and sophistication of some of the academic products that are coming out of her curriculum is really uh, provoking other teachers to get really interested in it. So that's one thing that we need to work on. Um, the other thing is that um, a lot of uh, kindergarten and first grade teachers are pursuing a synthesis of nature-based education and uh, Reggio Emilia approaches. And the Reggio Emilia approach to early childhood education documents a curriculum in a very graphic, uh, continuous way as a way to show parents and other educators what's actually going on. So it's not just kids playing in the woods. Uh, so it's the documentation of good practice to show teachers, uh, to show other teachers and parents and administrators where the learning is, um, is something that um, er, nature-based early childhood folks and elementary educators need to be doing more of. And I just actually, I am just heard that I'm gonna do a book, another book to follow up on my Nature Preschools and Forest Kindergartens book. And it's gonna be based on a lot of the documentation that our graduate students have been doing of their work to naturalize early childhood and early elementary classrooms. So that's, that's how we're trying to assist with this. Uh, there's something else that I wanna bring up and I wanna take a break for a second. So I'm gonna get you to ask me another question. Sure. Uh, well, I have a, um, a few more. Um, one is, is really the, the one that I'm most interested in. When I really think about you know, the opportunity that nature preschools offer uh, in reconnecting kids to the environment, really, you know, really redirecting our path away from a consumer culture, all of that, it's, it's great to dream that one day all kids will be in nature preschools, but right now that's not the case. Uh, and in fact, I have a, a five-year-old son who uh, I would have loved to send to a nature preschool, but the closest one, was, uh, there was only one in the D.C. area and that, that I know, found, and that was a, an hour metro commute each way. So that just is, wasn't going to happen. Uh, is, that the one, is that the one that's in Arlington? Uh, in uh, Bethesda area. Um, oh. Yeah, so well, either way, I, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so, you know, I did a lot of the nature preschool work myself. In fact, I mean, it was only today we processed acorns again. Uh, that's one right. of our big uh, chores together or uh, you know, efforts. But so, I mean, how do we get from a few here and a few there to the thousand that we, there's, there are in Germany or, or even more, one in every community or, or as this one community you just mentioned where the demand is so high that we need multiple ones per community? Right. How do we scale up? Yeah, the, the best example of scaling up is going on in Seattle right now. And it's a program called Tiny Trees. Um, and uh, they run six uh, nature kindergartens in public parks in Seattle, or they ran six last year. This year, they're either running nine or 12. Um, they don't really have indoor facilities. They meet in city parks. Um, the whole orientation towards facilities less programming means that they can pay teachers more and uh, charge uh, parents less because they don't have facilities costs. So they're really trying to figure out how to bring the cost down and make it accessible to a broad range of folks on the socioeconomic spectrum. At the same time, uh, a lot of these programs don't meet early childhood approval guidelines by the whoever does the licensing of early childhood programs. So the folks that have been involved in the Tiny Trees program in Seattle have uh, uh, gotten legislation passed in Washington state to do a pilot study of a number, like a, of a variety of different programs around Washington so that they can uh, develop new guidelines that allow for these uh, nature programs to operate uh, on a full day schedule rather than a part day schedule and also be available for uh, 
public funding in early childhood programming. So uh, the, this, I think this is one of the first examples of legislation uh, at the state level to try and figure out how to redesign certification programs so as to take in these uh, potential uh, program designs. Um, that's one great uh, thing. This other interesting program uh, called Tinker Garden is a program that um, uh, it's being done at like 750 sites around the country. And it's, um, it's a parent family nature classes. Um, and uh, Tinker Garden leaders get trained to do nature play curriculum, again, in public parks. And so they run programs mostly for two to five-year-olds that are parent kid programs happen for an hour and a half once a week. Um, uh, and it's, it's, making it, it's making this approach available to lots of parents. Uh, and they have a, they're developing a good scholarship program. Um, and so that's a going to scale kind of model. It's not, uh, it's kind of a, a little stepping stone towards a fuller nature preschool or forest kindergarten experience for a lot of parents. And then I just think the, uh, the work that uh, that we're trying to do here at Antioch University New England and it's starting to happen at other higher ed institutions so that you're training uh, educators in the virtue of this approach and providing them with some of the uh, understanding of the research that suggests why this is appropriate is another important task. So if I can summarize that there's the kind of the le legislative pathway the creating the demand through you know, creating you know, little courses that get parents and kids kind of excited and, and actually right. creating the professionals that, that can then run with this uh, right. as exactly. things expand. Is, are there, is that the three kind of key elements? Those are, those are three good ones, yeah. Okay. I can't think of any more right at the moment. Great. Well, th those were my most important questions. Uh, please, you mentioned you wanted to mention something. Um, no, that was the, I wanted to talk about the Seattle, the Washington State initiative at the moment. Great. The other thing that's really good, and I can't remember whether this was in the chapter for the Earth Ed piece, is this whole uh, a range of organizations that are roughly called nature mentoring organizations or wilderness education organizations. And they kind of quietly operate under the radar in lots of places around the country. There's a great, uh, there's a great example of it in Santa Barbara, California called the Wilderness Youth Project. Um, and there's a great example in Northern Vermont called Earthwalk Vermont. And they, um, uh, they do one day a week programs and they're in North central Vermont. There are a lot of parents that take their kids out of public school for one day and send them to the earthwalk programs. And um, in Santa Barbara, the wilderness youth project is now doing one day a week programs or one day, every other week programs with a bunch of the sixth, a bunch of the fourth grade classes in Santa Barbara. So these partnership programs between nature mentoring organizations and schools to start providing this opportunity is another way to bring, to give more kids the opportunity to have, uh, you know, regular outdoors uh, learning opportunities on a weekly basis. Great. Yeah, I, we have something like that here in the D.C. area too called the Ancestral Knowledge, and they have, uh, they offer kind of getting out into the woods and providing primitive skills and, and trainings to kids and, and an annual retreat for families. So yeah, those are another great opportunity. That's there's, also, there's also a great woman in the uh, DC area that works with a bunch of uh, Montessori schools, a woman named Amy Beam. And she does this kind of work with, um, I think it's three or four different Montessori schools. One that's right adjacent to Rock Creek Park in the district and then a couple that are right over the line in um, Maryland. So they're, they're there. You just don't hear about them very often. Yeah. The, the well-kept secrets of, of getting kids into nature. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, David. This has been really helpful to, to get a better sense of, of how we bring 
major preschools into the future. Uh, I right. think that's an important pathway out of our sustainability challenges. Uh, right. And to hear it from you is, is very helpful. So thank you very much for, for sharing uh, today. Thanks for your interest. You bet.